So today is the first of three Q&A lessons that I'll be doing, and all of the questions come from my Patreon followers. So Patreon followers are people who support the site through Patreon, and they've left comments underneath my Q&A um, asking different questions, and then I've organized them into sections. So today, we'll be looking at practicing music and reaching higher levels. So I think that all of the questions today um, relate to either practicing or the um, trying to reach for a higher level in music. If you're interested in joining my Patreon, there's a link for that in the support page. So just find the support link below the video. Video two will be um, all technique questions. So just questions about guitar technique. And video three will, all, will be all about sound production from, from nail noise to guitar sounds and, and all those things, questions. So the first question comes from Ralph. He says, clearly mastering the classical guitar requires a lot of patience, hard work, and correct instruction over years to get to your level, as well as perhaps inspiration from teachers. Could you talk about how you yourself dealt with these challenges, and if there was an experience or two in your musical development that enabled you to break through to a higher level? That's an excellent question, and I think it's really relevant to everyone who studies an instrument. Um, for me personally, I did go to music college, so, um, you know, when you go to music college, it's a pretty intense time of, of your life. And actually, for me, even before I did any college, I actually just took two years and studied at a, at a conservatory, taking music theory, musicianship, and lessons, and playing chamber music. And um, I just spent that time just absorbing as much as I could. So that, for me, that was part of it. But for my advice to students is that, one, you got to listen to a lot of music by other instruments, not just guitar, but you have to listen to symphonic music, to vocal music, solo cello, solo piano, um, early music, you know, all, all the different music history. And, and taking some music history or learning about music history um, will answer a lot of questions. If you can absorb music in that way, um, you'll a lot of questions about interpretation can kind of be answered. So... Um, that's one aspect. Um, playing chamber music with other musicians really, really helped me. Um, it forces you to play musically, rhythmically. It forces you to come to terms with some things in your own playing that you might not address if you just practice alone. When you're with other people, you're kind of, you know, you have to address some issues. And also, I, I worked with some of my not only best friends, but um, people who are highly educated and also just great musicians. And I learned a lot playing in chamber music, playing with those people because, you know, they might say like, let's try doing this in the music or let's try doing this or let's analyze the music together. Just a whole large amount of information and ideas to absorb. So chamber music was really important. And the final thing I'll say, and this is very important, is that there's a part of music that really is just athletics. Um, people often, you know, write in saying like, what's your muse or do you meditate or, or what? But there, there really comes a time and there definitely came a time for me when I realized that I just didn't have the athletics in my hands to play the repertoire that I wanted at the level that I wanted to play it at. And so I had to just dive into technique really uh, like a lot. So I went out and got, you know, Tons of technique books, tons of, um, my teacher had me get lots of like etude books, like all the Sor etudes, all the, you know, Villa Lobos etudes and all the Carcassi. Um, and I, I would practice technique for hours. I used, I, I would even sometimes put on like a movie and like practice technique through the entire movie, which I don't necessarily recommend. You should pay very close attention, but I just, I needed the athletics in my hands. I needed to up my game in technique. And so I just, I had to do it. And of course, for my students, I recommend that you do that gradually by practicing, you know, 15 minutes to 20 minutes of technique every day over a period of years. But there was a time for me when I, I decided that I was going to practice technique for a couple hours a day. And, um, and that has served me all the way up to now. Um, you know, it created a very strong foundation um, for, for what I do. And I, I still have to practice more technique. I'm not done, of course. I still have things to learn and get better at, um, mistakes to correct. Um, so it's a never-ending thing, but there was a time when I, I just realized I have to be a better athlete on my instrument. Okay, John asks, do you study other genres of music, for example, jazz, 
as a way to improve your overall playing and understanding of music composition. Um, for me, I did take music theory for a long time, so uh, it didn't necessarily help me um, learn more about music composition. But yes, uh, practicing jazz and, and rock and pop music definitely enriched me as a musician, no doubt about it. Um, I even briefly went to jazz college, um, just briefly. But um, it, there's a couple of things about it, like pop and rock music. I actually like doing that with my students a little bit. Uh, because it can really help them work on musical rhythm and groove away from sheet music. Uh, and just, you know, and also imitating music that they listen to on the radio, you know. Um, that imitation and that process of making it sound um, sound good is, is can be very important. Jazz is spectacular for your fingerboard knowledge. And yes, I have studied a fair amount of jazz. I don't consider myself a good jazz musician. But I can get by. I can play chord charts and I can play in a group if I have to. I'm not so confident with soloing um, over, chord, over complicated chord charts, but um, yeah, learning all, that, all those chords is, was great. And before I even went over like the sheer scale book, for example, um, I had already learned all of my major scales um, in, you know, full positions over the entire guitar. So like doing all my G major patterns and also calling them by their mod modal names as well um, was hugely important. So I went through all of the patterns with, uh, through my study of jazz before getting that Shear scale book, for example. And when I went to the Shear book, it was more just about reading. Like I already knew all the patterns. Um, and, I, and I knew a lot about my fingerboard because I'd studied, you know, all the triads and their inversions and I'd done lots of jazz chords and learned like when I'm, when I'm doing a seven chord, I can make it, you know, a 13 chord and, and things like that by changing the chord, um, scale degrees of the chord. So yeah, it taught me a lot. I will caution everyone with one thing though, is that jazz is a big world. If you get a jazz book to study, it's it's going to be an intense book and it's going to be an intense study. So it might not be the best use of your time management. Uh, it's a big world and I do encourage that you, you take a look. But at the same time, you do have to realize like there's probably some, th some things about classical music that you have to learn. And um, if you want to play classical music, um, studying classical music theory and doing classical, you know, like musicianship and things like that um, is also very beneficial. So it's not like an easy out to go study jazz. Um, jazz is a big world on its own. So is classical music. I love studying all of it. And, um, and I've had lots of time in my, in my life to dive from one to the next and to immerse myself in different styles. And I played lots of electric guitar when I was a teenager, so lots of, you know, rock and metal and stuff like that. So I've had a, quite a well-rounded musical experience, and I think it enriched me and taught me lots about the fingerboard on the guitar. Um, but nevertheless, you, you have to just make sure that you're managing your time and studying what you should be studying, and not like diving into jazz and forgetting about your technique routine for classical guitar and or, or classical music theory and things like that. Okay, um, Ernesto asks, what are your thoughts on repertoire maintenance? What is a healthy interval for revisiting older pieces to maintain a good balance between progress and repertoire competence? And Hayes also asked a similar question. As an intermediate player, should I practice one piece at a time until I'm satisfied with it, or several pieces at a time, occasionally adding a new piece and dropping one? This is a tough um, question for me to answer because every student is different and everyone has different goals. But let me just talk about it a little bit. First thing, um, as a teacher, when I'm teaching one of my students, um, they have to do one of two things with a the piece. They either have to complete it to a performance level, so that means performing it for me or a camera or in front of an audience. Um, and or if they if they study the piece and they are going to drop it at some point, like they don't want to perform it, and they don't like the piece, they either have to replace it with um, a piece that has similar a similar skill set. So they have to accomplish a similar piece with a similar goal uh, before they can they can drop a piece. So it's 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 and you know like sometimes we'll replace it with an easier piece. So if it's a piece that has lots of slurs in it and you're sick of that piece. 
Um, either you've accomplished the piece, the slur, the slurs in the piece, um, and you want to move on because you um, you just don't like the piece anymore. That's fine. But if you didn't accomplish the slurs uh, to a good level, then you have to maybe replace it with a different piece that has slurs or an easier piece with slurs that you can accomplish more easily. So a healthy interval to um, maintain pieces, you should always be working on some new material. Um, in every practice session, you know, you have your technique section and you have some new material and then you have your core repertoire that you're playing to perform and and for your own enjoyment and things like that. Um, we have to make sure that we are separating the idea of playing music and practicing music. Uh, those are kind of separate things. When you practice, you're really trying to accomplish um, goals and correct things in your own playing. When you're playing music, you're just you're enjoying music, you're experiencing music. So um, you can't shortchange yourself on the practicing of music. When it comes to playing music, that's kind of more connected to whether you're preparing stuff for concerts or if you're just doing it for your own enjoyment. And then you can cycle through that material as you like. But when it comes to practicing, you need a, you need a plan and you need a goal. And you need to be identifying things in your practicing that need to be corrected. And if you haven't accomplished that, then, then you need to have a plan to make sure that you do accomplish it, either through the current piece that you're working on or a new piece. When you study with a music teacher, um, the teacher will guide you through this process. Um, when you're studying on your own, I know it can be very difficult, but one thing I'll say is that sometimes it's okay to be sick with a piece, but keep playing it. Um, it can just be a small part of your practice session. It doesn't have to be your enjoyment playing. It can be just like something that you do. You're maintaining a piece with slurs for a really long time because um, it's healthy for you to do so. Bringing it up to... Um, a competent level is it's a tough thing too because everyone's levels is a little bit different. Um, but I think making sure that your repertoire is easy enough that you can accomplish it is the most important thing. If you're if you have a piece and you just keep practicing it for months and months or years and it's just you're really not accomplishing it, then you should be maybe playing easier pieces that you can accomplish. And one of the goals of my site is that I'm trying to find as much like music at, at lower levels that is really enjoyable because I think people in general should be playing repertoire a little bit easier than they think so that they can accomplish it confidently. So the majority of your of your repertoire should be material that you can accomplish um, reasonably within a, a certain amount of time. Beginners pieces and beginners move through repertoire more quickly. Intermediate and advanced students may take um, a whole year to learn their piece, right? The pieces get bigger and more complex, so they take longer to learn. But just make sure that the majority of your, of your repertoire, you are accomplishing it to, you know, something that you think is, is, is um, acceptable and, um, and good. And if, if you're not, then you should consider just like taking the majority of your pieces and making sure they're a little bit easier. And then you can have a couple of challenge pieces that you're doing for fun and for a challenge, but um, the majority you should be able to accomplish. So I hope that kind of answers it. It's a tough one for me to answer because every student has different goals. Some students are playing concerts. Some are just practicing at home. Um, others have teachers and they're trying to prepare stuff for, the, for their program, their music program or something like that. Um, other people are doing chamber music. So it, it's, it's a complex question. Uh, but the simple answer is to make sure that you're playing repertoire uh, within your level. Karen asks, I was wondering, how do you approach a new piece of music? How do you decide dynamics and color of a piece? So how I, I'm assuming like all the array of things that you decide when you are learning a piece, how do you decide those things? Part of it is based on experience. Um, like I said before, with the music theory, and music history, a lot of your interpretive questions will be answered by listening to a lot of music by good musicians and identifying the historical and geographic um, location of, of the people who wrote the music and um, learning just what sounds right. So what sounds right for Baroque lute music? What sounds right for Romantic era music? What sounds right for Renaissance trills and renaissance ornamentation you know your ear can answer a lot of these questions 
Your education can answer a lot of it too. Music theory can um, really help with that. Music theory and performance practice, historical performance practice can answer that. But for the average student, it's tough to dive into performance practice. It's a big world. You might not have time to read tons and tons of books on the topic. So listening to more music, um, dedicating more time to just enjoying music, but also being aware of where it sits historically. Listening to it on period instruments, so the instruments that were played during that time period, like instead of piano for Bach, listening to harpsichord for Bach. Um, instead of uh, guitar for vice, listening to lute for vice. Um, it, this will give you an awareness of how the music sounds, and that, that answers a lot of the questions that you're, that you're um, talking about in regards to um, dynamics and colors and, um, and just articulations of pieces. When I approach a new piece of music, um, I do listen to a lot of music by the composer, and I, I try to listen to how different performers perform that music, and I try to listen to it on period instruments, but also what modern interpretations sound like of that music to inform me of what the experience is going to be like. Um, I, also, through my music theory knowledge and my music history knowledge, um, I can you know, I can imagine what a lot of the decisions will end up being like. But the truth is, is that pieces are very organic things. When you start a piece, you don't know what it's going to end up like. You don't know what speed you're really going to end up playing it at. You don't know a whole bunch of, of considerations. You might practice the piece very evenly with a metronome, without many dynamics, without much rhythmic, um, you know, contrast. And then decide later that like, oh, you know what, this piece is a little flat when I play it like that. I better add, add more here and add more there. And you might um, analyze the entire piece and say, this is the structure of the piece. This is the introduction. This is the development of the piece. This is the recapitulation. And, you, you know, in the middle of the piece, when it gets really exciting and the music is, is changing keys and there's accidentals everywhere, like sharps and flats, and it's all exciting, maybe that's where you're going to increase the dynamics um, and keep that rhythm going. So... Uh, as you get to know the piece and you analyze it like that, you can make informed decisions based on experience, music history, music theory, and just also just by your own um, listening of yourself playing the piece. So uh, lots of things come into that question. And when you listen to a professional play, they have so much experience in all those areas that their interpretations are often um, quite um, informed and also tasteful. So um, as a student, you can try to do a little bit of that. And the more of each of those things that you study, the more you'll feel informed. But I think that listening to more music is, is really a big part of that. One last question. Walt asks, recently I started recording the audio of my practice and playing with replay. I found that there's plenty to correct, which I was less aware of while playing. Do you record yourself or have thoughts about doing this? I record myself a lot because I put out the weekly uh, videos for the website. I'm a little bit more in teacher mode when I put out the weekly videos and I perform pieces um, compared to my like personal interests and personal practice time because the site has become like a, a business and a, and a, a full-time thing for me. Uh, it's a little bit different than my personal time with music. But nevertheless, um, I think it's a good thing to record yourself on occasion. Um, be careful though, um, guitar sounds very dry through recording. Um, it's not, it doesn't pick up a lot of the room noise, and if you don't have great recording equipment too, you might be disappointed with the way that you sound. So just don't let it become a negative experience. But if you could kind of just get past the fact that the microphones are a little bit harsh, um, then you can use it to hear certain things in your playing that you might not otherwise hear. I certainly notice things about my technique by watching videos of myself. Um, I hear things about my tempos, like, oh, I'm, you know, drifting off the tempo a little bit there, or my phrasing doesn't sound as connected as I thought it did. Um, and even if the quality of your recording is bad, that's actually kind of a good thing. It'll probably emphasize the things that are the um, the, the biggest challenges in your playing. So by taking away all the reverberance of the room and giving you a really dry, awful sound, it might point out, though, that your actual legato connection could be quite a bit better. You know, if you slap on a lot of reverb from your music um, recording software, it might sound like you're really legato, but if you turn that all off, um, it, 
it might show you that um, that that you need to connect your legato a little bit more. So, like I said, yes, any tool that you that helps you identify issues in your own playing, use it. Use it to your advantage. But um, you can't let it become a negative experience, and you have to be careful that you don't do it all the time. Uh, you have to learn to listen to yourself while you're playing in an objective way, which is very, very difficult um, to listen to yourself in that way when you're trying to do the fingerings. Like sometimes it's hard to know. Like, did I just did I play legato? I don't I don't know. Um, so recording yourself can definitely help with that, and um, I like it as a way of of completion and this kind of connected to an earlier question when can you give up a piece well if you can record it and you're pretty happy with the result of your recording or you think it's pretty acceptable for a student at your level then you're probably um, done with the piece as long as um, all the considerations that should be considered have been considered um, but you're, you're, you've, you've accomplished something you know it's like a, a record of accomplishment you don't have to show that finished audio recording or video to anyone it can just be part of your development folder on your on your computer or something and saying like, yeah, at this point in my development, I played like this. And that can be a great record, a document to have of your progress. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, you don't have to show it to anyone, but you can keep those recordings. And I wish I had kept every single one because it's really interesting going back and looking at my old ones and, and just saying like, being more reflective on it, saying like, yeah, I just had to work on, I had to work on my technique more five years ago because my legato just wasn't good enough or my slurs were too sloppy before I fixed them. And uh, so I think that's, that's all really healthy. So use it to your advantage, but uh, make sure you're also just mostly, mostly practicing in the normal way and, and, um, and just positively moving forward and enjoying yourself.